Being a Linux content creator, I think that a lot of people are just going to instantly assume that I must be some sort of diehard free and open source software advocate. And while it's not necessarily wrong to say that I am a free and open source software advocate, at least in some respects, calling me a diehard one might be going a little bit too far. And I'm not saying that if you are one of those people who tries to eliminate every single piece of closed source software on your system, that's a bad thing. Or if you really don't care about open source software at all and you just want to use all closed source software, I'm not saying that's a bad thing either. All I'm saying is that I want to clarify where I stand on this. So when it comes to being a free software advocate, generally my answer to this is yes, I am. The short answer to that is yes. I'll generally be saying you should use free software and if someone asks me for something to use, I'll normally just recommend the free software unless. And this is where it becomes a little bit more nuanced. So to properly answer this question, it will take a little bit longer because otherwise there wouldn't be a video here. So I'm going to be breaking this video down into a couple of different parts. So the first part is about how I like to release my software, which is generally just things like scripts and configs. There's occasional proper bits of software in there, but it's generally just scripts and configuration files. The next part I want to talk about is how I think that other software should be released. Then I want to talk about the software that I use. And then I want to cap it off by talking about whether I think that it makes any sense to try to eliminate closed source software from your system. So the first point is how I like to release my software. So as I said, it's generally just going to be scripts, configs, and when it comes to the occasional software, that's normally going to be things like a website. Now I also have a bit of an interest in game development, and the answer for my website and for game development is actually a very, very different answer. So. Anything that I intend for public use, so my scripts, configs, and just general website stuff, all of that I'm probably just releasing under the GPL. I know that my scripts and configurations are. My website, I haven't started writing. I know there's one there. I'm going to scrap that one. I'm going to redo it because every time I start writing that website, something changes and I want to do something different. But anyway, those are being released under the GPL because pretty much I don't see any reason to not do it. And if I wanted to just do it for the memes, I would probably release it under something like the WTPFL, which I don't remember exactly what that stands for, but it's basically the do whatever the F you want license. I think there's four lines in it, and it's the most permissible license that exists. You can do whatever you want with that software. And if it's something that I just don't care about, I'm just going to release it like that, because for software like that, I don't see any reason to close source it, for a couple of reasons, actually. I think there's three or so reasons. So the first one is that... If I make it open source and then someone sees it from my channel or they just happen to stumble across it, what they can do is they can offer suggestions if they want to. So if maybe they want to use my repo and they're like, hey, here's this thing you could do to do this better or here's this thing that's broken and here's a better way to do it. So a concrete example of this is I've had a couple of people look at my scripts and say, okay, well, this says it should be in POSIX script but you've gone and used something that's a bashism. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize that. And then I went back and actually fixed it. Or someone pointed out, oh, here's this weird edge case where this script actually acts in a way that you don't expect it to. I was like, oh, I didn't notice that. Thank you for pointing that out. So that's one of the reasons why I just open source that software because I can just get help from random people. And I feel like that's why companies like Microsoft do it as well. So things like VS Code being open source, what you can do you can basically just outsource your bug detection and because you do that, well, you don't have to do it as much internally. And another reason why I like to release this stuff open source is because I have this channel and this channel is mainly about helping people. It's mainly about showing software and doing tutorials and just generally making it so it's a little bit easier to get used to using things like Linux and specifically in my case using things like tiling window managers and Arch Linux. So it just doesn't make any sense to hide away my scripts that I'm using in my videos or hiding away the configurations that I'm using in my videos because another thing is that a lot of people like to use the scripts and configuration files from their favorite creator. And I don't know why I'm your favorite creator if I am. I, I don't get it. It's weird that anyone would think like that, but my scripts have a hundred or so stars on them, so I'm assuming that people are using them. Same like configuration files. I assume people are using them if they're starring the repo. I have no idea though. So because of that, it also just makes sense to let people use them if they want to use them. I don't have anything to hide in my scripts and configurations, so I might as well just let people use them if they want to use them. So I was mentioning earlier about web development and game development. So when it comes to a website, I don't see any reason to close source that either because you're going to be able to see most of the JavaScript anyway. Obviously, if I did something in the back end, you wouldn't be able to see that. But for anything on the front end, well, 
the JavaScript gets sent to your web browser anyway, so I don't see a point to try to close source that because if you really wanted to reverse engineer my website, you've got most of the JavaScript there. So go right ahead. I, I really can't stop you doing that. But for game development, I do actually see a reason to close source that if I was going to do it myself. Because I get that some people like to rely entirely on donations and rely entirely on things like Patreon. But if I was doing game development, I would probably want to sell those games. Now, I wouldn't be selling them for much, but I'd much rather sell them than rely on things like in-app purchases or even worse, relying on ads. I feel like having a small cost of the game is probably a better way to handle that than doing the alternatives. When it comes to how other software should be released, I don't really have that strict of a stance on this. Really, it's just like a sort of guideline approach to how I think software should be released. But really, the first thing I wanted to say is do whatever you want. Honestly, I don't really care enough. What I say is release the software the way that best suits you or best suits your company if you're working for a company. If you think that releasing it open source is going to be a good thing because you have people suggesting issues, you have people doing bug tracking, you have people working on features, that's cool. Do open source. But if you want to do closed source because... I don't know, you want to have security by obscurity, or you don't want people to see your internal library calls, or things like this, then hey, release it as closed source software, that's fine. I don't really have a do or die approach to how you should be releasing your software, I just have a rough set of guidelines. So, the first one I want to talk about is software that is free, as in monetarily free. So this is completely free software, so no ads, no in-app purchases, no data mining, it's just a piece of software you download, it runs in your computer, it doesn't send your data anywhere, it just does a task on your computer. For software like this, I, I genuinely can't justify it being closed source, I don't know why you would ever want to do that. Obviously someone's probably going to make the argument that if it's a piece of software that must be secure, then making it closed source is going to make it somehow more secure because of security by obscurity, but I'm not going to get into that today. That's an entire video in and of itself, and I know that someone's going to bring it up now that I mentioned the term security by obscurity. It's going to annoy someone. But for anything that's not like that, so a PDF reader or a media player, anything like this, I, I don't know why you would close source it, because if it's open source, as with the scripts and the configs that I release, you can have people suggesting issues, you can have people doing bug testing, you can have people actually working on it. All of this stuff is way harder to do if you close source your software. But if we move away from the desktop to mobile development for a bit, if you want to do closed source because you want to do things like ads and in-app purchases, I don't like this, but I can live with the fact that if I want to have a piece of software that is going to be monetarily free, I need to have some sort of compromise. Now, for software that I actually use on a frequent basis, so something like the simple mobile tools, something like that, I like that it is completely free. So if you don't know what those are, it's basically a bunch of very, very basic mobile applications. So things like a calculator, a notes app, a media player, and other things that are very, very basic. And they are completely free. So they don't send your data anywhere. They don't sell you ads. They don't give you in-app purchases. I guess it's technically one in-app purchase, but this in-app purchase is basically the equivalent of a donation. It basically will let you change the main color of the application and for a feature like that you can effectively treat it like a donation. So my preferred method to actually support these applications is generally through a donation system but there are some apps where I can get why they still want to make money and no one would ever donate to them. So for example I was with my family the other night and we had a trivia night and I needed some sort of buzzer so I could buzz in for the trivia. And I'm never going to donate to a piece of software like that, so I can get why you want to have ads in that, just so you can fund the development of this software, even though it is very basic software and it doesn't take that much time to develop, it still takes a little bit of time and I can get why you'd want to have some sort of monetary return from it. And if we move back to the desktop for a bit, I don't think this same model really makes sense on desktop. If you're going to have your software be monetarily free on desktop, don't have ads in it. If you want to do in-app purchases, I guess that's okay, but do not have ads in it. Either have it be free with in-app purchases or have a donation system or let people just pay for the software and then get rid of all of that junk. That's kind of how I stand on the desktop software. Now, talking about paid software for a bit, this obviously has to be closed source because if it's open source, well, why would I pay for it? I can just go and compile it myself. If you're going to do open source, a paid software system basically just turns into a donation system. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, 
but for some software projects, I think that there's a little bit too much work being put in them to just leave them up to donations. Now, I know that some projects that are absolutely massive projects do actually rely on donations, so things like Caden Live, but I can get why if you are making something like a video editor, a game engine, a 3D modeling piece of software, or just any other sort of CAD application, why you would want to make that proprietary and then why you would want to charge for it. I get that there are really big projects like Blender and Caden Live that do actually survive like this, but without having a big advertising push or some brand name recognition, it's going to be hard to fund a new project like that. Now I know that you can also argue that a project probably shouldn't be that big if you can't fund it like that, but as I said with those earlier pieces of software, some projects are just going to be naturally bigger. So you can't really make a competent video editor without making it to the scale of something like Adobe After Effects or anything like that, because otherwise people will just go and use that alternative instead. So if you have a large team, a long development time, and other things like this, which will really eat into your budget, I get why you'd want people to actually pay for that software. Now I do also like it when projects also have like a free community version, so things like the JetBrain Suite has a community version, Visual Studio has a community version, I think that Qt Creator has a community version as well. And in the case of Qt Creator, I think the community version actually is open source. So you could also do that dual licensing method as well, where you have the free version be open source, and then the paid version having extra features and that one being closed source. And I don't necessarily see this as being a bad thing. So moving on to the software that I use on my system, let's say we have two equivalent pieces of software. So we have Vim and we have proprietary Vim. And the difference between these pieces of software is basically that one is open source and one is closed source. In this case, pretty much there's no reason to not use the open source solution because there are some selling points to actually using open source. So typically you'll get a richer plugin environment because people have more of an understanding of how the software works and what they can do with it. And because it's open source, people are just gonna be more naturally used to working on the software. And also along with that, you have things like application forks. So the main version of LF, which is a terminal file manager, doesn't have image support. But then someone was like, hey, I want image support in LF. I'm going to add image support. And now a fork exists that has image support in LF. And with a closed source piece of software, that just wouldn't be possible. You'd have to go and ask the devs, be like, hey, can we have this feature? Rather than, well, the software's here, I'm just going to do it myself. So it gives you way more freedom about what you actually want to do with your software. So I know I went on a bit of a tangent there, but that started from two equivalent pieces of software. So Vim and proprietary Vim. Now, in the real world, this is generally not a realistic scenario. Generally, you're going to have one piece of software that is better. So whether that has more features or in some cases even less features than another piece of software. So the reason why you might want less features is because you're not using any of those extra features. And it could be quicker and it could be smaller and it could be more customizable. So generally, one of these pieces of software is going to outshine the other in the categories that I care about. And to be completely honest, I will generally just pick the piece of software that outshines the others in whatever category I care about today. And one example of this is with the JetBrain Suite. So if I ever need an IDE, the JetBrain Suite is what I go to every single time. And the JetBrain Suite is closed source. And I don't particularly have a problem with this because I feel like they perform better than any of the open source IDEs. So I've tried out things like Eclipse and I feel like they just all pale in comparison to the JetBrain Suite. So even though the JetBrain Suite is closed source and there are open source solutions for an IDE, which are generally good pieces of software, I feel that the JetBrain Suite is just so much better than those that I don't even really care about the fact that it is closed source. So I would say the best way to describe my stance is as software pragmatism. So what I mean by this is I will pick the best tool for the job regardless of whether it is closed or open source, rather than picking a piece of software because it is closed or open source. Now, the fact that I use a lot of open source software kind of says a lot about the state of open source software in 2020. For a lot of categories, open source software is generally just going to be better. So for a text editor, Vim is by far better than anything I've ever used. For a video editor, Okay, I can kind of say that Caden Live isn't better than anything. I would, I'll drop Caden Live at the drop of a hat, but Caden Live is a bad example. So for things like a media player, MPV, way better. PDF reader, Zathura, way better. Web browser, Brave, pretty much better than any of the closed source solutions. Now I know you can argue Firefox is better than Brave, but we're not going to get into that today. Firefox and Brave are both better than any of the closed source solutions. And for my operating system, I run Arch Linux. 
Arch Linux is way better than Windows, and I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone watching a Linux channel that. So while I do tend to use a lot of open source software, it's mainly just because a lot of it is just simply better. It's not because it's open source or closed source, the open source stuff is just normally better, so that's why I use it. Now the last thing I want to talk about is eliminating closed source software from my kernel or from my drivers and things like that. So this doesn't really bother me, I don't actually care about it. So when I talk about the software that I use, I talk about the software that I actively use. Anything behind the scenes in the kernel, as long as it's doing its job, I don't care if it's open source or closed source, and that's the reason why I'm not running a distro like Parabola. I don't really care about the proprietary blobs that are in the kernel, as long as they're functioning, and they're functioning the way they should be functioning, that's fine by me. So if I was using an NVIDIA GPU, for example, and the Novo drivers work better right now, I would use the Novo drivers. Or if the proprietary NVIDIA drivers work better right now, I would use the proprietary video drivers. I'm not going to just pick it based on the fact that it's open source. I'm just going to pick whichever just does its job. But when it comes to software that I'm actively thinking about, then I'll actually go and make this decision. So my opinion on this has really shifted over the past year. When I first started using Linux, I did everything with free and open source software, even if that free and open source software would really handicap me. So I would use things that really didn't make any sense when there was a way better closed source solution. But over time, I've kind of come back to a more, I guess a more middle position where I will use the software that is better. If it happens to be open source, that's cool. If it's closed source, that's cool as well. But I'm not going to handicap myself just for the sake of using open source software. And maybe by next year, I'll shift all the way back to free and open source software. But right now, all I'm going to say is that I'm completely open to actually changing my mind on this. I'm still only a year into using Linux, and I could be completely wrong. So if my stance on this is completely wrong, feel free to let me know where I'm going wrong down below. I'd be more than happy to read it. So I think that's pretty much everything for this video, but before I go, I want to thank my patrons. So a special thank you to Joachim Craig, Nathan, Andrew Monster, the PWD Road, Tony Donald, and Zilver. If you want to join the Patreon, there'll be a link to that down below, as well as my Amazon affiliate links where you can buy the gearies in this channel, or anything else you want and a small kickback for. Also remember to go check out my podcast, that is Tech of a Tea available on Library and YouTube, and the audio version available wherever you listen to audio podcasts. Also remember to check out this channel, also available on Library, BitTube, and BitChute. And remember to smash the like button and leave me a comment down below. And remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below as well. So I think that's pretty much everything for me and I'm out.